into the world. One is our community work, where we work with people across the seafood supply chain, whether that's fishermen, uh, fish processors, culinary partners, distributors like Sodexo. Um, we work with college institutions to promote sustainable seafood in all of those arenas. The second is a K-12 education. So this room is usually filled with 50 rather loud fifth and sixth graders, and two of my colleagues who run that program every day are here tonight. Uh, and we, uh, we see about 70% of the state's fifth and sixth graders here for a two and a half hour exploration of the Gulf of Maine. Our second program is a citizen science program where we have kids go out into fields, forests, streams, all across Maine and look for invasive and non-invasive and native species. Um, we're happy to t I'm happy to tell you anything about that. I am, as Sir said, I'm Chief, <laughs> Chief Education Officer Lee Peak, so I do actually know about that part of our work. Welcome. Um, so, um, tonight we are gonna hear from Wakale and Lisa Kerr. These are two of our scientists working right here uh, in, in, in the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Wall holds a joint appointment with the University of Maine School of Marine Sciences and the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. In the past five years, Walt has been studying the energetic condition, spatial distribution, foraging ecology, age and growth of bluefin tuna and the broadbill swordfish in the Atlantic. Lisa is a fisheries ecologist interested in understanding the structure and dynamics of fish populations with the goal of enhancing our ability to for sustainability to sustainably manage fisheries and ecosystems as a whole. She's particularly motivated to understand the role of complex population structure and connectivity play in the productivity and stability of local and regional populations. Uh, this lecture is one in a series on uh, debunking ocean myths, and so tonight we're focused on tuna debunked myths and misconceptions about Atlantic bluefin tuna. I am up first. We all set? Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Lee for the introduction and uh, also, uh, more importantly, thank you to everyone here today coming down to GMRI. If you haven't been here before, welcome. And uh, if you have been here before, thank you for returning and uh, dedicating some of your time. We all have very busy schedules and we certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight. So. As Lee mentioned, we're gonna talk about Atlantic bluefin tonight, and it's called Tuna Debunked, Myths and Misconceptions About Bluefin Tuna. And the reason we chose this topic is because we, we live um, in an age now where we are under constant bombardment for, in, from information. The information comes to us from a variety of different sources. It comes to us through conversation, it comes to us through our computers, through our smartphones, social media, the paper, and at any given time, 24 hours a day, we can ask a question and we can try to get an answer to it. Oftentimes the information is contradictory. Just because I say something doesn't mean that it actually is what it is or just because this gentleman says something it doesn't mean that's what the information is. And so what we're left with, especially in the world of fisheries, is a lot of uncertainty, a lot of confusion, and a lot of mixed messages about what happens or what's going on. What is the actual status of a particular stock? And if you were to do these uh, searches for, for example, for Atlantic bluefin, what you'd find is that the majority of the information that you would see, especially those first few hits, would be very much focused on what I would consider the negatives about bluefin. And so if you did sort of a word cloud, you would see the words that would pop out like decline, endangered, dying, fishing mortality, longliners, purse saners, whales, mercury is another really big one, extinction, overfishing. And embedded in, the, in that word cloud and embedded in the, the information that you can get on the web, are actually some positive signals about not only Atlantic bluefin, but other fish stocks, particularly those in the United States. And so tonight as we go through, what we're going to do is to try to, for these reasons, try to talk about some of these misconceptions or myths, if you will, or potentially misinformations about Atlantic bluefin tuna. And hopefully by the end of today, we may not answer all of the questions, certainly, but hopefully by the end of tonight, we can either guide you into the direction of properly researching your topics and being a little bit well, more well-informed or maybe we can actually give you specific answers uh, to your questions. And of course, if you have questions, you can ask those at the end and we'll both be available uh, at the end of the talk and even afterwards if uh, you wanna ask a question kind of offline. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is, is a bluefin a bluefin? If I was to say to you, what does the word bluefin mean? Does it mean Atlantic bluefin? Are there more than one bluefin species? Are there multiple bluefin species? As a consumer, 
When you go to the marketplace, more often than not, you're going to see something that will say bluefin tuna. The reality is that a bluefin is not a bluefin. And it's important to understand where your bluefin are coming from, because there are actually three species of bluefin that are distributed around the globe. Tunas, as you know, and as you'll learn later, if you're not aware, are highly migratory. They basically can cover entire ocean basins. And so here, you actually have three genetically distinct species that don't intermix with each other. They don't interbreed. You have the Atlantic bluefin tuna, which is in the far right-hand side, of course, in the Atlantic basin. You have the Pacific bluefin tuna spread out through most of the Pacific Ocean. And then you have the southern bluefin tuna, which is represented by the vertical bars on the bottom. It's a very temperate tuna. It lives down in the southern hemisphere. And so if someone says to you, a bluefin is a bluefin, it's not true. And when you look in the marketplace, there is a distinction between what an Atlantic bluefin is and what a Pacific bluefin is, especially when it comes to consumer information and status of the stocks. Thanks. So how many of you have heard um, the term endangered associated with Atlantic bluefin, or bluefin in general? So uh, this is pretty common. Um, and I would say it's a fiction. Um, and there's a lot. There's a lot of confusion out in the in the uh, you know looking for information online, um, and you can find a lot of different perceptions about what the health of bluefin um, means to different people. With some people advocating for increased fishing on bluefin and increased quotas, in other groups such as Greenpeace is a very vocal ad advocate for ceasing all bluefin tuna um, fishing globally. And so there are a lot of perspectives on what is the status of bluefin. Um, and there's also, um, because there's three species, as um, Walt mentioned, there can be a lot of confusion because people can associate one uh, status on a particular species like Pacific and attribute it to Atlantic. And, and it can be very confusing for the layperson to distinguish these subtleties. Um, but what I want to, my point here is that there's sort of one um, arbiter of uh, the official stock status for each of these um, species. Each of them has a distinct, uh, what we call regional fishery management um, organization. And for Atlantic bluefin tuna, that's ICAT, that's the International Commission for Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. And so this is a group that every couple of years is gonna assess the status and make a formal declaration of what the status of the stocks is. So the most uh, recent status for Atlantic Bluefin indicates there's no overfishing on this species. Uh, in the US, we also have a status determination that can happen through ESA, which is the uh, Endangered Species Act. And so there's been um, two, two petitions to consider Atlantic bluefin tuna over the past decades um, to be listed under ESA, and the most recent one being in 2010. And there was a very thorough review of whether this species could, should be listed at this time and it was deemed not to be warranted. But interestingly, you can look at other international organizations also can uh, attribute status like endangered, vulnerable, and threatened. One of these is the IUCN, which is the International um, Union for Conservation of Nature. And so interestingly, at the same time period, these two, uh, the US, um, US Fish and Wildlife and IUCN both considered listing Atlantic bluefin for um, as endangered, and they had different outcomes. So IU, they had different criteria, and IUCN listed um, tuna bluefin as endangered. I would say that this um, current designation is out of date and isn't up to date with what the current data would suggest. Um, so they, you can still find this designation online, but it reflects old data and an old, older perception. Uh, to make things even more okay. confusing, we have um, status determinations for by other groups like Seafood Watch, which will, uh, is more about giving consumers advice on whether they should be eating a certain species. And so because there isn't necessarily species by species um, identification in the uh, seafood market or on your plate, they have made a blanket statement of just saying to avoid all bluefin tuna. Um, and that's where that comes in. So there's a, a, lot of, a lot of different perspectives, but I think I, my takeaway here is that there is one official um, status determination for each of these. And this is the uh, specific regional fishery management organization for each specific um, species. OK, next one. There's some information out there about how much we actually know about bluefin. So through extensive scientific study, we have developed a good understanding of bluefin biology. 
that is a lot of fiction. And I'll <laughs> describe that in detail. So here in the, in the United States, we have a very, what we would consider a very long history of fishery. One needs only go down to Gloucester, Massachusetts, see that our history is, is quite deep. It's been there since we've settled. There's the wall of all the fishermen who have been lost at sea and so forth. And that goes back 450, 500, maybe 600 years. But if you truly want to look at what an ancient fishery looks like, you have to look at bluefin because through history there's been no fish that's been as revered, as studied, as observed, or as admired as a bluefin tuna. And you can see that in the cave paintings here throughout countries in the Mediterranean. Aristotle wrote extensively about bluefin in 350 BC on his treatise of the history of animals. He actually documented how fishermen observed the basking behavior of bluefin and took advantage of it to get their nets around the tuna and drag them to the shore. Uh, Obviously, it's been in art, poetry, philosophers. It's been stamped into currency. So for about 6,000 years, we've had our eyes on bluefin. We haven't had our eyes really, really keenly on bluefin. But as a society and as cultures, we've understood how to catch them and how important they are. Through time, we, of course, have been able to understand some basic information about them. First of all, bluefin are big. They're one of the largest bony fish in the ocean. They aren't the biggest, but they are certainly really close. Uh, this is the current IGFA record. It's 1,496 pounds. It was caught in Alds Cove, Nova Scotia, which is not actually that far away from here. We do catch fish over 1,000 pounds here in the Gulf. We sampled a few this year. So lengths in excess of 10 feet, weights in excess of half a ton, uh, while not commonplace, do happen. And so if these fish can run the gauntlet of predators, including humans, they can get quite big. And of course, if you get this big, you actually have to start out really small. And one of the most fascinating things is that these organisms actually start out as an egg that's a millimeter long. They're spread out by their parents, and they're left on their own. And they float around through the ocean. They gradually grow. And then eventually, if they can escape all the predator windows, they end up as um, something like this. So we do have a pretty good idea about bluefin body form and function. They're long, they're fusiform, and they are designed to swim and swim with authority. Along the same lines, we know a little bit about their internal anatomy. So we have roughly 26,000 plus species of fish on the planet, give or take. We know a lot about a lot of them and a little bit about a lot of them as well. What sets bluefin and many of the tunas and a couple of the shark species, aside from the rest of the fish in the world, and this is a big one, is that they are warm-blooded. There are very few fish in the world. In fact, there are 23 that are warm-blooded. The bluefin is kind of the king of the warm-blooded fishes. It can keep its internal body temperature as high as 85 or 88 degrees here in the Gulf of Maine. This is almost unheard of in a fish. Most of the time, if you're a fish, whatever the water temperature is, that's your temperature. But bluefin, because of this specialized circulatory system, are able to keep their heat in their body. They have extremely large gills, 10 times the size of an equivalent sized fish. So they, it's like us having the lungs of an elephant. So they can get oxygen out of the water very quickly, and a lot of it. And they have a lot of red muscle. Red muscle in fish is what drives your long distance and sustained swimming. So all of this is red muscle in a tuna. And if you've ever cut open a tuna, you can see what that red muscle looks like. So you couple these things together. Oh, whoops, I went backwards. Couple these things together, and you get an organism that can pretty much occupy uh -oh, most of the North Atlantic basin. So everything you see here in red is where bluefin have either been observed through fishing operations, caught, or tagged, and we've seen where their tags have ended up. So they have an, an incredible distribution in the spatial realm here, so basically you're everything on the surface, but also keep in mind because of their body plan and their physiology, these organisms can go from the surface down to about 3,000 to 3,500 feet in just a matter of minutes, and then come back almost as quickly. And so they have an, just an incredible body plan. It allows them to exploit not only lots of the ocean in this realm, but also what we can't see, and that's the vertical plane that would go back into the screen. A couple of things we do know about them is we know that um, we know ways to actually age them. So for people, it's quite easy. When I ask my son how old he is, he will lie to me, but eventually I'll get the question, I'll get the answer to the question, which is I'm 11 years old, Dad. We, of course, lack the communication ability to talk to animals and figure out how old they are. And so we need to be able to figure out an end around because age is extremely important when you're trying to manage fisheries. You don't want just very young individuals. You want a mix of young individuals, medium aged, and older individuals. And the way that we do that is we look for specific structures. So myself and my staff uh, go out in the summertime, and we actually collect these guys, the pieces of the tuna that people will throw away. We collect the heads. And the reason we collect the heads is because buried deep in the skull is a structure called an otolith. There's actually three sets of otoliths. These are the largest ones that we collect. 
And the otoliths are kind of like a very small data recorder. And they grow from the time that the fish is in the egg until the time that the fish dies. And the cool thing about an otolith is that not only does it grow with the fish, but it grows with the fish according to the rate that it's, it's growing. So in the summer when the fish are growing quite a lot, it will lay down material on the otolith in a very dense packet. And then in the winter time, when the fish are not swimming, or excuse me, not swimming, but not feeding and putting on as much weight, it will be a less dense area. The cool thing is you take the otoliths out of the head and you cut them in half, lay them on their side, and this is what they look like, and you shine a light through them. And when you shine a light through them, because they grow different in summer and winter, that's exactly what you see. And so we are beginning to put together, for, for actually the first time, some uh, very large records of bluefin age in the Gulf of Maine and in the Canadian Maritimes. In terms of how long they live, we have fish that are over 35 years old in, in our archive and the archive of our colleagues. We believe they can live probably around 40, 40, maybe a little bit over 40. So compared to a rockfish, they're not a really, really old fish. They don't live over 100, but 40, 45 years of, from a fish's life is a pretty, pretty good time, pretty long time. Uh, age of maturity. This is something that science has grappled with for a very long time, decades actually. And um, I'll, just, I'll just set the stage for you. There has been disagreement for many, many years about how old a bluefin is when it spawns and also where a bluefin will spawn. We know two things. One, we know that there are bluefin that spawn here in the Gulf of Mexico. We also know that bluefin spawn in the Med. Those are the two formally accepted spawning areas right now. Interestingly, just a, just a couple of years ago, larva, bluefin larva were found up here, all the way up onto George, past George's Bank over towards the seamounts. And so now there's discussion about this being another spawning ground, which we didn't actually know about. So that kind of gets back to, we know everything? We don't know everything. In fact, this is a very, very new discovery uh, just within the last couple of years. And the other thing is, how big are they when they spawn? If you're managing a fishery, you don't want to kill a fish until it's had a chance to spawn. The problem was, for years and years and years, this is what we thought. We thought 50% of the fish could spawn at age four in this spawning ground. But if you came over here for the exact same fish, it was 10 years old. So one fish spawned at 10, and one fish spawned at four. Why would that be? We don't have to go into details, but now the evidence is coming through that the, the, the ages are actually closer now than we originally thought. There's some evidence to suggest that this uh, age is actually lower than it was uh, originally thought to be 10 years. So there's some information that's coming out about that. Uh, big fish, got to eat big food, right? It's the only way you can survive. If you're really big, you got to eat a lot of big stuff. It's actually the opposite. Bluefin don't eat a lot of real, real big stuff. Yes, they can eat bluefish. Yes, they can eat striped bass. Yes, I found a seal pup in them. Yes, I found a bird. I found a coconut, a Prestone oil bottle, you know, antifreeze bottle. Found a lot of things in their belly. But if you look at decade after decade after decade of, of data, what you'll find is that these organisms will actually eat primarily Atlantic herring. Very small, pelagic, high energy food. That's what they're looking for. Remember, they're big, they swim fast, they heat their body, they have a high metabolism, you have to fuel it. The way you fuel it is by eating things like Atlantic herring, small pelagic fish that are high in energy. Uh, real quick, if you wanna just see a real quick one. So this is us filming some fish that we're eating next to the boat. Bluefin, we call them pigs with fins. Uh, because they're actually quite lazy, and if you feed them, they will just sit at your boat for some time and, and, and eat food. Uh, about 100 or 105 inch fish up here, based on the calculations that we done, we've done, depending on the year. Let's say you have a 105 inch fish, and the fish is here for five months. That fish can put on somewhere between 100 and 140 pounds. That's a good year, though. That's a good year with good feeding conditions, sort of under optimal conditions. And they will eat and eat and eat and eat until they actually physically can't eat anymore. And in fact, the Monterey Bay Aquarium kept tuna in their tank when they first got it. And if I remember the conversation I had with Chuck Farrell, he said they ate so much they actually floated. Um, they kind of had heart disease, if you will, because they ate so much. OK, so here's one uh, that always comes up. And so I thought I'd talk about it. <laughs> and uh, um, this one's probably uh, the, one of the most heated uh, discussions when it comes to public health, consumption of seafood. And so I posed this question. And you can ask this question a lot of different ways, but this was an easier way for me to ask it. Consuming tuna will give you mercury poisoning, yes or no? I would say that that's fiction, and I'll tell you why. First of all, mercury 
is a very complicated element. And as we grow, we are exposed to lots of different things. Every day, just after we leave here, we're going to get exposed to a lot of different things. But there are some, there are some basics. Is mercury toxic? Absolutely. No question, it's a neurotoxin. Absolutely neurotoxin. Is all mercury the same? No. We have organic and inorganic mercury. The mercury that's really bad for us is the methylmercury. That's the mercury that animals get when they're in the ocean or when they're in our freshwater lakes and rivers. And that is a bad one. Methylmercury is extremely toxic, extremely toxic. The other problem with it is it accumulates over time. So as all of us eat food throughout our lives, we are sort of this big collection of different elements, metals, contaminants, etc. And so when we um, get to be 80 or 90 years old, our contaminant load is much, much bigger or much larger than someone who has just been born or four or five years old. And you can see that here with fish. This is the age of the fish. This is the length of the fish. And as you get longer or as you get older, you can see that the mercury concentrations go up. Does my body get rid of it? Uh-huh, your body can get rid of it. We have filters. We have ways to get rid of mercury in our body. The problem is that sometimes we eat too much and we can't get rid of it fast enough. And that's how it will accumulate in your tissues. Um, do all similar size and age fish have the same mercury levels? No. They absolutely do not. And you can see that here. See this green guy? He's got really low mercury levels. Same size, same age fish, really, really high levels. So it's all over the board. And you can see that here with that kind of shotgun pattern. There's some discussion about, well, if I eat mercury and the fish actually has selenium in it, which tunas do, that's a good thing. Hasn't been settled yet. There's some, there's some uh, data out there that suggests if you eat a fish that has a lot of mercury, but if you also eat a fish that has a lot of selenium, it kind of acts like, a, it, it kind of counteracts the effects of mercury. Uh, the jury's still out on that. No one has really put forth a, a really good, consistent argument. And so the question becomes, what the heck do I eat? Right? So if you want to look for sources, I'm not a physician. Lisa's not a physician. I'm not going to stand here and tell you what you should or should not eat. But I can give you the basics. The EPA and the FDA last January came up with a set of guidelines. In uh, 2000, I think it was January of 2017. You can go to their web page and you will get this. This is sort of a best choice, good choice, choices to avoid placard. When you look at this, though, keep this in mind. The EPA and the FDA utilize this as a, as, a, as a sort of proxy for women who are pregnant or women who are expecting at some time to become pregnant. This isn't for, say, uh, an average age or, or size male. This is as, about as conservative as you can get. So it's, they're really trying to be conservative about your consumption levels. So what are our values? These are the best choice values. These are the in-between values. And this is what they say to avoid. Okay. So again, it's geared towards pregnant women or women who are going to be pregnant. So what do we know about bluefin? Uh, what do we know about the guy who's trying to operate the mouse? <laughs> Can't do it. Okay, so this is the most recent data on Gulf of Maine bluefin mercury. A couple of take-home messages. The average was from about... Uh, 2004 till 2012, 2013. So we had nine or 10 years worth of data there. The average from this entire time period was just above the ceiling that's set by the EPA and the FDA. So it's right around that upper margin, maybe a little bit above. But remember, the smaller fish and even some of the bigger fish are above or below that threshold. It's kind of a mixed bag. You don't know for certain what any particular fish is going to have. The good news on this, though, is that Mercury concentrations in fish just over 10 years fell 19%. And there's some idea that that might actually be because we're, we're curbing our mercury pollution a little bit in the United States. We're, we're a little bit less reliant as we are on coal-fired uh, power plants and things like that. We're starting to diversify our energy portfolios, and we're releasing less into the atmosphere. And if that is the case, that's a great thing because 19% in 10 years is pretty good. And so where are we now? The 19% reduction gets us right to that upper limit, gets us within inside that bounce. So would I eat tuna? Uh, yes, I would eat tuna. I do eat tuna, and I eat a lot of it. And what I can tell you is just a couple of things. There are no known natural causes or cases of mercury poisoning from the consumption of marine species that I'm aware of. If someone finds one, I would welcome uh, to, to see it. The only ones I know about are actual industrial accidents. Someone had point source pollution. Someone ate the fish that came from there, and they became very sick. There's a great example in Japan. It was a very tragic and just an awful situation. In those cases, um, in those cases, people had mercury concentrations in their body that were over 700 parts per million. 700 parts per million. 
we're talking about 0.46 parts per million. And when they started to feel the effects of mercury was at 191. So again, we, we're very concerned, not we, but the government is very conservative about where you should, where, where the consumption levels are set. The general population in the United States, as in other developed countries, is right around here. That's where we are. And look at the amount of seafood we eat. We eat about 53 pounds per person per year. We live around 78 years. Japan is more than double. They live to be 83. The Faroe Islands eat almost 200. Iceland's 200. Maldives is 313. So again, it's not a cause and effect. But what I like to do is just assure you, at least from my perspective, that you can eat tuna and not feel as though you're poisoning your body. There are lots of details to talk about. And again, I'm not a neuro, neurotoxicologist or, or a physician. But we can, we can certainly discuss the details later. But if it was me, I would say that I eat tuna and, and I wouldn't um, tell anybody not to eat it. Again, do you eat it every day? No, you have it once in a while. And that's generally what we do as US consumers. Actually, most US consumers eat far less than the recommended seafood um, a week. Thanks. Um, so this statement is um, something you might hear about in the news. Um, bluefin tuna management is highly politicized. So this is a fact. Um, this is something I participate in as a, I participate as a US delegate to ICAT, which is the management organization uh, for bluefin tuna. So ICAT, as I said, was the International Commission for Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. And they're really responsible for all the management of tuna and tuna-like species. So there's a species like swordfish in this region. There's so a lot of member nations, so all, you, you can see them in this map in green, as well as uh, these are cooperating parties that cooperate with ICAT. So a lot of member nations that are incorporated in this international management of a species like bluefin tuna, some that you might not expect, that, um, such as China, but all of those countries that are highlighted have some fishery interest in bluefin tuna. There's 51 member nations currently, and um, there are, there's always the chance for developing nations to petition to become a member nation of ICAT. So ICAT's main job is really collecting data from this complex network of all these uh, fisheries and countries that participate in the um, harvest of bluefin tuna in the region. They also conduct the stock assessment, so they, are the deter they determine what the status of the stock is, and they make management recommendations. So this is the group that's going to um, make the recommendation about what the quota is going to be, the quota is the harvest level, um, for the next year or two. Uh, one important thing to note about bluefin tuna is that we don't manage as, as one single entity. It's managed as what we call two stocks. And a stock is just uh, some jargon we use in fisheries to um, describe one of these boxes. So we spatially delineate um, stocks. So this is the western stock. And I think um, Walt mentioned that this group of fish is spawning in the Gulf of Mexico. And we have an eastern stock that we know spawns in the Mediterranean. And so we have this management boundary that essentially splits the Atlantic um, down the middle. So we have two stocks. And the countries participating in the fisheries for these two stocks differ. For the western stock fisheries, things are a little simpler. So we have three main parties participating the US, Canada, and Japan. And the percentages you can see here uh, denote roughly their allocation of the pie. So whatever quota goes to the West, um, it gets divvied up between countries first. Uh, and then within countries, gets divvied up between different gear types. So Eastern stock fisheries is much more complicated, as you can see. Um, primarily, um, the European Union collectively is going to uh, take you know, the, the largest portion of the pie, more than 60%. And then we have these intermediate players that are getting a portion of the allocation. And then we have a lot of minor players that uh, actually harvest bluefin as well. So this is quite a complicated um, group of uh, different countries to manage through this international organization. And the challenging thing is that we need all these countries to contribute their data and contribute accurate data so we can assess the status. And we need them to agree uh, to adhere to quotas and to comply to regulations. So you can probably tell by the different slides up there, that's a challenge. We don't all agree politically in general in um, agreeing to a, a specific set of rules. It's even more challenging. So ICAT had a pretty um, tarnished reputation, I would say, in the 80s and 90s for um, 
being thought of as not a very effective management organization. I would say that things have improved a lot and ICAT management has come a long way in recent decades, but there's still some, some issues. So one of these issues is that um, the, the science that gets done at ICAT does underpin the ultimate management decision. And by management decision, I mean how much fish we decide can be caught um, in a particular year. But the scientists then pass that management recommendation along and then begin the negotiations. So there's between country negotiations uh, around this quota. And in many cases, the short-term economic gains of increasing a quota can take precedence over perhaps uh, the sustainability of the resource. So there's still some um, tension there. I, uh, Bluefin tuna is known uh, for what we term IUU, which is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. This was particularly bad in the 80s and 90s for the eastern stock and has improved considerably in recent, uh, the most recent decades. It's thought to be much lower, but it certainly still happens. It's just basically fish getting caught and nobody, you know, nobody writes it down, nobody records it, nobody passes that data on to ICAT. There are still member compliance problems, so people adhering to the, their quota allocation. And there's often, uh, one of the biggest problems is getting member countries to contribute their data and to contribute their data in the same level of quality that we get from other nations. This can maybe be particularly challenging in some of the developing nations that might not have the fisheries scientist, science capacity that other uh, countries like the US and Canada have. There's still an issue of overcapacity, kind of just too many hooks in the ocean, too many people out there targeting uh, bluefin. And there's always this tension around allocation. So uh, how big is the pie, how much, quota is going to get set, and who gets uh, the biggest piece of the pie. So um, you guys might not be familiar, as familiar with this statement. This is the kind of statement is just getting some um, kind of airtime more recently in um, the media. And I would say this is a fact. Atlantic bluefin tuna numbers are actually on the increase. Um, and before I get into the, showing you what the actual numbers are, I want to talk to you a little bit about how we get at the status of um, bluefin tuna. So this is a species that's moving all around the Atlantic. It's very challenging to collect data on, and we don't do a, conduct a formal scientific survey like we do for in New England for you know looking at what cod biomass is or haddock biomass. We can't survey the entire Atlantic basin. So we rely primarily on catch data, so information from the fishery, to assess the status of the stock. So these are the ABCs of stock assessment. And a stock assessment is essentially an exercise to reconstruct how many fish uh, were alive back in time. And some of the key pieces of information we need is some indication of what the abundance level is. So we get these indices of abundance from different fisheries. As I said, most of our Data comes from directly from the fishery, not from scientific surveys. So this red and orange um, trend line shows you the trend in catch or relative uh, abundance in the Canadian rod and reel indices. And these are uh, hatch lines or some trends from uh, specific parts of the US rod and reel uh, fishery. And so we bring those, a whole bunch of indices of abundance into a model and try to resolve what the trend is over time. We also need to know something about biology. So Walt talked about aging fish using otoliths. So we need to know the age of the fish. We want to know at what age is it mature? When can we expect it to start reproducing and um, having new young fish? And we also need to know at what, what rate it dies of natural causes to put that information to a stock assessment. And one of the biggest pieces of information we need to know is catch. So this is where it's crucial to get all these countries to bring together accurate catch information. You can think of catch as being sort of the building block of a stock assessment. So if you knew how many fish you caught this year, the ha there had to be at least that many fish alive in the prior year. And then you build from there, you reconstruct. So if there were that many fish caught and this many, this many fish we think die of natural causes, we can start to reconstruct what the actual population abundance was back in time. Oh, this is my clicker. Um, and so we bring these three pieces of information into statistical models, and we run our models, and we can output an estimate of what the biomass is for Atlantic bluefin tuna, for eastern and western stocks. And we use that biomass level to help us determine what is a sustainable level of fishing going forward in time. So for the next, we usually set this 
on a few years at a time. And then we'll come back, redo the stock assessment. So what I want to point out, though, is these error bars I have here. So because there's uncertainty in each piece of this information that goes into the model, there's uncertainty in, what, in our estimate of what is the biomass of the western or eastern stock of bluefin tuna. And um, it's, it can be pretty big. There's a lot of uncertainty over here. I talked to you about illegal and reported catch. We uh, still have uncertainty about biology. And it can be challenging to get accurate information all the time from uh, different certain fleets. But once we have that, um, go through that process, we get an estimate of uh, what we call spawning biomass. So this is how many fish can actually spawn and reproduce in the population. So this is hot off the press. This is just came out of ICAT this summer. And uh, this is something I participate in and go, we go to Madrid every couple years. And all scientists from all those fl uh, flags I put up, there's scientists from all those nations come into one room for about two weeks. And we sort of battle out what is the best parameter to put in this? What is the best you know, indice? What is the best model to use? And we really hash it out as to what is the best way to estimate the status of the stock. Um, what you should notice, one of the first things you'll notice is the difference in the relative abundance between east and west. So it's huge. It's an order of magnitude. The eastern stock is far more productive than the west. Um, the other thing you should notice here is this big increase. Um, this is uh, the second stock assessment that's taken place since we started seeing indications of increase. And so the first one, there's a lot of uncertainty whether this was a real um, increase. But uh, I think we feel pretty confident now that there is a strong increase in the spawning stock biomass. So bluefin tuna has been under a 20-year rebuilding program. And so it's really promising to see this uptick in biomass. So because I've sort of highlighted the western stock here, because you can't really, it's dwarfed essentially by the eastern stock biomass. But if you zoom in as well, um, you can see that we're seeing, uh, likewise, an uptick in biomass in the western stock as well. So very promising for Atlantic bluefin. So once we have this um, assessment of status, or assessment of um, the biomass, we do this formal status determination. And there's two different ways we do that. One of them is about how hard are we fishing. Um, and this is the over, whether, we, whether a stock is, or whether overfishing is occurring. It's about the rate of fishing being higher than a target level. So if you're up in these quadrants, you're above, above your fishing target level. Um, and whether you're overfished. So this is uh, whether your current biomass, is, if you assume this is your target level, if your current biomass is above your target, you're in this happy zone. Uh, your, your fishing is low and your biomass is high. You don't want to be here. This is where your biomass is low and your fishing level is really high. And so this is how we make some status determination. Uh, and so this is what we came out of ICAT most recently. So this is a determination that both the western and eastern stock uh, have no overfishing currently occurring. <laughs> Interestingly, uh, the overfish status, so that means what is the biomass relative to the target, is deemed undetermined for both of these. And this really reflects our uncertainty about um, bluefin tuna. So we, we have so much uncertainty about what even our biomass target should be that um, just this year, ICAT shifted to not using that metric at all, which is typical for other fish. Um, but they are continuing to use the overfishing metric. Switch over here. OK. And just so you know, um, scientists and managers don't communicate so well, so we have to use the emojis. That makes it easier <laughs> for everybody. So this, yay. Mm, stoic, not so good. And frown is not good. OK. So. Uh, when we talk about fleets in the, in the Atlantic, who are the big players? Is the U.S.? Uh, nope. The U.S. is actually not even a drop in the bucket, if you want uh, to know that. This is the representation of landings in the Atlantic, and the United States is right here. This little light blue line at the very, very bottom is us. So with respect to the entire landings in the Atlantic, um, even though we get 57% of the Western quota, as Lisa alluded to in that slide, that 57% is actually coming out of a piece of pie that's very, very small. So we don't get a whole lot. And that is illustrated in this figure. If you want to look at the difference between fishing pressure in the Eastern stock, the Mediterranean, African nations, here, European Union, and the Western side, you need only look at this chart. Each of these bubbles, these little Pac-Mans right here, all of those circles 
the bigger they are, the more landings they represent. So if you're seeing big circles, that's a whole heck of a lot of fish that are getting caught. The colors just represent what gear types are catching them. So for example, here there's a lot of purseiners. Here there's some traps and there's some bait boats. Really what you want to concentrate on are the size of the circles. Now if you come over here, you'll see that the, effort, or the landings across the middle of the Atlantic are fairly sparse. And then there's some larger landings here. And Lisa and I think we identified a problem. This actually should be up here. There's not more landings in North Carolina than there is in the Gulf of Maine. The Gulf of Maine is the largest section of landings. But in any event, the idea is that we are but a small, small player in Atlantic bluefin landings. And so, whoa, whoa, whoa. One of the things uh, we can look at is what do our fleets look like? What licenses are actually granted in the Gulf of Maine? Do we have purse saners? We did. 1958, they started the fishery. They, were, they officially started the commercial fishery in the United States. They're the ones that had the first documented landings, official landings. We have five purse saners left. They were more or less grandfathered. I can get into the nuances of it. They're pretty much gone. Uh, for legal purposes, I think they're gone. Um, and I don't think they're going to be fishing anymore. So the purse saners are kind of out. We do have pelagic longline fleet. According to US law, pelagic longliners are not allowed to target bluefin. In other words, they can't set with the intention to get to catch bluefin. They can't control how many they catch in a given set because it's a hook in the water. They're allowed only bycatch. So if they set a hook and they're going for swordfish and they catch bluefin, that's a bycatch product. By far, our largest component of US fisheries and subsequently landings of uh, commercial sized bluefin are done by rod and reel. We are one of the few countries that utilizes rod and reel as our primary gear type and lands the majority of our tuna one at a time on rods and reels. Um, you'll notice there are a couple different categories here. There's an important distinction. The general category means you use rods and reels on a commercial basis and the intention is to sell your fish. If you are in the angling category, you can use rods and reels. You can retain a fish. You can't sell it, but you can eat it. That's the difference. It's a very important distinction. Here you can sell your fish, here you cannot sell your fish. Again, we have purse saners, longliners. We also have a very small harpoon fleet. I think, you may know the answer to this, I think there's only four boats this year, or three boats. There was only three or four boats in the whole fishery. Uh, so it's very, very small, and they get about 4%. Um, uh, excuse me, yeah, about uh, harpoon, about 8% of the quota. So our fisheries are not all that diverse. How about this one? If you fish for Atlantic bluefin tuna, you are in the money. You are making it. I mean, you are making it so good, it's not even funny how rich you are. I mean, you're just loaded, 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 loaded. Um, that's not true, OK? And I'll give you some examples. So for a long time, we've all heard stories about how much you can get for Atlantic bluefin or tuna in general. but. Really, the big markets were for, were for Atlantic bluefin when they took off. Several years ago, National Geographic came here and started the reality show Wicked Tuna. It's their most popular show in the history of the network, OK? It is super, super popular. But it also gives a false sense of reality. It gives a false sense of reality of what happens on the boat. But more importantly, it's the prices. Okay, when they bring the, the fish to the, to the dealer, if you've ever seen the show, you'll see the truck arrives and it's supposed to transport the fish from the boat uh, into, the, you know, into the truck. Number one, they don't give you prices, at least not that I'm aware of, they never give you a price at the boat. Okay, I've sold a lot of fish, they never gave me a price at the boat. The price is determined later on. Secondly, when they give a price, it's not gonna be $20 a pound or 25. Can you get lucky? Yes, and every year we have a few fishermen here that get lucky, and you will get that $10,000 or fifteen dollars or maybe $20,000 fish. It happens. It does happen. Is it the exception? Absolutely. Is it the rule? No. Negative. Negative. In fact, if the dealers who hire these drivers actually had to pay that money, those drivers wouldn't be employed very long because they would make one deal and they'd be fired because you can't sustain that. And then the other, way, the other reason we think bluefin are these super lucrative fisheries is because, hey, this one sells for $1.76 million, right? One fish, $1.76 million. How is that possible? It's possible because this is the very first bluefin landed in Japan on the very first day of the first new year. 
and a couple of people got in a bidding war about whether or not they were going to get it. I'm going to get it. Lisa's going to get it. I'm going to get it. Lisa's going to get it. I'm going to get it. Lisa's going to get it. I'm going to get it. And then eventually Lisa says, I'll buy 1.76 million. You got me. I'm not going to bid that much. Okay. And so it's kind of, they bid it up. This is, again, the exception to the rule. Where is reality? Here's reality right here. If you fished in the 70s and the early 80s, you were lucky to get a dollar or two dollars a pound. When we figured out that we could ship these economically overseas, yes, the price did take off. There were years where the average prices were up in the um, high single digits or maybe even around 10 or 11, $12 a pound on average. So we did have some very good years. And don't get me wrong, $12 a pound times 500 pounds is a pretty good paycheck for a fish. No question about it. But prices have come down and then they went back up and then they also have started down this end here and if we were to put in 2016 and 2017 we on 2016 would be probably closer to around 585 and then if we counted this year we would be i would guess although i don't know exactly but they would be lower i know this year because of the way the landings happened a lot of fish went for next to nothing they really went for next to nothing a dollar a pound dollar 80 a pound 225 a pound something like that so there was value in it. There still is. I mean, $6 a pound is not anything, you know, is, is much more than you get for ground fish, but it's not like it was years ago. And the other misconception is that all of these fish that we get go to Japan. Japan takes every single fish that we get. They just want fish, 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 fish. And that's not reality either. In 2012, we exported 66%. And in 2016, we only exported 28%. We actually have a very strong domestic market here in the United States for bluefin. A lot of people don't know that. We are beginning to get an appetite for sushi and sashimi. Does it pay as well? N not usually, but you can unload some fish here. So again, we have a lot of uh, domestic fish. Uh, okay, so next one. Do we have the technology to tell where the fish migrate? This one's actually a cool one because yes, we do. So we have a fish that can migrate all the way across the ocean from one side to the other. And how the heck do you track something that does that? We have a series of different tags. We have conventional tags and then we have electronic tags. They do two different things. This tag will actually track uh, where you caught the fish, and then later on, somebody will recapture the fish in point B, and they'll report it to you. And you'll get an estimate of where the fish started and where the fish ended, but that's it. These electronic tags are a little fancier. They'll actually record information on the location, the temperature, and the depth that the fish swims through uh, every single day. So really quick because I don't want to spend too much time on it. But this is how we put those tags on. So fish takes off, and I'll zoom ahead a little bit to us. So we bring the fish up to the side of the boat. And once we bring the fish up to the side of the boat, if you want to see, we have some of the satellite tags over there. We'll lift up his tail. And once we lift up his tail, we just have the tag and a tagging stick. Fish comes up, exposes its back. And then we'll apply the tag into the dorsal musculature. It looks like I hit him really hard. I do hit him really hard, but you have to hit him really hard because their muscle is exceptionally dense. The tags are $5,000, so you really don't want them to come out of the fish if possible. So what do the, what do the conventional tags tell us? Those little plastic darts, this is what they tell us. They tell us that a fish was maybe captured here and tagged. And then look at this. 50 days later, that same fish was caught 6,200 miles away in northern Norway. Okay. That same tag, not excuse me, that same type of tag was put on a fish here, and then this fish was captured four years later down here in Argentina. But it was captured four years later. Still gives you the same data. You don't know anything in between except point A and point B. The cool thing about the electronic tags, you can actually follow the fish where they go. So here, you have two fish caught in the same year, in the same school, in the same location. One went over here to the east, and one stayed in the west. I told you tuna are good swimmers and fast fast fish and good jumpers, look at them, jump right over Florida, <laughs> right over the peninsula and then into the Gulf and then right back over Florida over here and then back up. Super fast fish, super, super fast. Following year, 2006, fish, same fish, same location, excuse me, two fish, same location, same day, two different things. One stays in the west, one goes over to the east. This is when I was working for my uh, PhD advisor, Molly Lovecabbage. Then we have complex multi-year movements. Here's a fish in the Gulf of Maine, then it goes down to North Carolina, then it goes over here, then it goes down into the med, then it comes back out, then it feeds for a while, then it goes back in, then it comes back out, and it feeds a little bit, and then it goes back in, and then it gets captured. So here you have a fish that was in the west, like the west, went back to the east, and then stayed in the east. 
And what we find is that these fish go all over the place. We have fish from the east that go to the west that stay in the west. We have fish that go in the west that go in the east that stay in the east. We have fish that go from the east to the west, the west to the east, and back again, and back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. And here's the bottom line. The only thing predictable about bluefin is they're unpredictable. That's it. And this is a hot off the press track. This is from our colleagues um, up in Canada, people that we work with. This fish just released its tag. This is 12 months of data. The fish started here in Port Mattoon. It made its way over to the Azores, circled around, came back, went down to Virginia for a little while, Carolinas for a little while, came back up to the Scotian Shelf, went around Cape Breton, came into the upper portions of Gulf St. Lawrence, and then its tag popped off right there. One thing you'll notice about this tag, did it go to this spawning ground? Or this spawning ground? No, it did something else. 600 pound fish, definitely spawning, could be in this region here. So anyway, tagging's cool, shows us all kinds of neat stuff. So another cool fact is that um, we have the technology to tell where, not only where fish move to, like Walt described, but also where fish are born. And we do this using the structure that we described previously, the otolith of the fish. So shown here is uh, two whole otoliths. We then section this structure. So this is, again, the, the structure that's found in the head of the fish, and it creeps continually throughout the uh, lifetime of the fish. It lays down annual bands that we can count to estimate the age. On basketball. There you go. You can pass that around. Uh, and not this structure is very, um, very, uh, very much of interest to fishery scientists because not only can we estimate the age, but we can also analyze the chemistry of this bone and learn something about where the fish originated from. And we're predict because we're looking for information about where the fish was born, we actually target this early growth period in the otoliths. So this equates to when this fish was small, a little juvenile swimming around. We could analyze the chemistry of this portion of the bone and find out where that fish came from. So we do that by, um, we, get a, we have a nice high-tech, um, what we call a micro mill machine. Essentially, this is zoomed in. Uh, quite large, but it's almost like using a dental drill, something your dentist would use. And we um, mill into that bone, and we produce the powder, which you see here. And then we analyze this powder uh, to determine the chemi chemical composition of the otolith. And the reason we can use the chemical composition of the otolith to find out where fish are from is because there's very different water chemistry around the globe. And lucky for us, there's very different water chemistry in the Gulf of Mexico the key spawning ground for the western stock, and um, different water chemistry in the Mediterranean, the main spawning ground for the eastern stock. And we're specifically looking at um, two groups of what we call stable isotopes. We look at carbon uh, ratios and oxygen ratios. And it's primarily oxygen that's really driving the difference between these two um, water basins. So you can see the, the difference in the heat map here. And so if you have differences in, in your water chemistry from two um, spawning grounds, that's going to translate into differences in otolith chemistry. And so it's almost like having a natural fingerprint that these fish have, contain in this, in this uh, structure. And we can analyze the structure and figure out where a fish came from if we catch it anywhere in, this, uh, in the ocean. Um, so first what we do is we establish baselines. So using juveniles that are known to be from the Gulf of Mexico and juveniles known to be from the Mediterranean, we establish what is the fingerprint for the west and what is the fingerprint for the east. And so we have these strong differences. You can see they separate strongly across. This is uh, the ratio between auction 16 and 18. And they separate strongly across um, that axis. And then uh, when we get samples from the fishery, so we get, a, uh, as Walt mentioned, we get the heads, take the otoliths out, uh, Walt ages them, we take them to my lab, we analyze for the chemistry, and we can then, so from these unknown samples, we don't know the origin, we can relate them to the baselines through statistical models, and we can estimate um, where they're from with you know, a certain probability. And so when we do that, we can start to get a picture of where fish are um, when you, you know, it, as you move across the Atlantic Basin. And ICAD has made a really big push in the last few years for all the researchers who do this type of work to contribute their data to an ICAT database. And so this just happened uh, this summer as well um, at ICAT, as everyone brought their data with them. And so there's over 5,500 samples now accumulated. And so what's pretty neat is you start to move from the Mediterranean, we see this a uh, water basin is going to be um, comprised of all eastern fish. Um, 
as you start to move outside of that area, you see a little sliver uh, in the contribution of western fish that have moved over that uh, to out, just outside the Mediterranean. As you get to the central Atlantic, you see a bigger slice of the pie is actually originating uh, in the west. And as you get to our shores, um, you see a much bigger portion are western origin. But we still have a big chunk of the pie that comes from the east, and these are the fish that we catch in our fishery. And again, when you're in our spawning grounds, you're primarily going to only encounter western origin fish. So there's pretty good separation in terms of where if you're spawned in the west, you're going to go back there to spawn. And if you're spawned in the med, you're going to go back there to spawn. They don't really switch spawning grounds uh, over the course of their lifetime, as far as we know. <laughs> uh, but we're always learning. That's, a, that's the thing about Tina. We're always learning new things about Tina. So that's sort of what I just showed you is sort of the aggregate level. So that's all this data combined over time and grouped into large spatial allocations. And what we're interested in and Walt and I work on is what's going on in a more high resolution within the Gulf of Maine fishery. And what we start to see is this mixing in east and west is very dynamic over time. And so we can look at the proportion of uh, fish within the fishery from either west, east or west origin in the 70s. It looked like we're primarily or almost wholly fishing on western origin fish, so fish born in the Gulf of Mexico. In the 90s, it looks a little different. Uh, a large chunk of the pie comes from the east. And in our most recent data we've gotten, it looks like um, almost the majority, about 60%, are actually eastern origin that we catch in our fishery. We can start to look at our data in different ways and look at how this might change as you look at fish that, as they increase in size. So it looks like um, when you look at the younger fish that are in our, we're interacting with in the fishery, these are going to be primarily eastern origin. So it's the young fish that we see in higher numbers coming over from the east. But if you look at the largest size class, more of these are, tend to be western origin. So if you're very old and big um, and you originated in the West, I guess maybe you got a little tired and you're hanging out over there. <laughs> you're, not, you're not doing that big extensive migration. You have more important things to devote energy to, like reproduction. Um, so I've talking, talked to you about all this great um, stock of origin information. And so um, this statement is Atlantic bluefin tuna managers recognize the importance of movement and consider it in their management decisions. And unfortunately, I have to say that this is a fiction. So right now, we don't incorporate all that good data in the way we um, make our management decisions. But there is work um, ongoing to get there. We're just not quite there yet. So the current way, I talked to you about the stock assessment. And the current way ICAT conducts stock, ass stock assessments is they assess how many fish are in this western box. They assess how many fish are in this eastern box. And they ignore the fact that fish move over that line. And so. They're basically just counting fish in a geographic area, so they don't care where they originated from. They just want to know how many fish are there. So they kind of ignore the origin information I just spoke to you that we get from Otis. Um, and so this is giving us a good view of the stock. So that's kind of the exploited unit of fish. So what ICAT is doing is kind of giving us a view of how many fish are in that western stock box that the fishery would interact with, and that's important. We need to know that to set accurate quotas. But what we're missing um, by only looking at the stock view is we're missing the population view. And that's really where our sustainability comes in. This is our sustainability unit, because the population is a unit that's going to move down to the Gulf of Mexico th together. They're going to reproduce together and produce new fish. So we do need to also track the population, which is um, really important to sustainability of the res resource and producing new young to replenish the resource. I keep thinking this is going to click. Uh, and we can run into trouble when we ignore stock mixing in our management. Um, so we can actually get to this point where we might see a decoupling between what's going on with our populations in the east and west and what's going on with our stocks, meaning that box of fish. So um, when we have, particularly the situation we have now, where we have an eastern stock that's at much greater magnitude of abundance compared to the west, um, you could have potentially have that stock on the increase in the west staying static. And if there's movement across this line, this could lead to the apparent trend that both stocks are under increase. And essentially what, we, what, we, what could be the case here is that we're just getting a subsidy of eastern fish into the western stock area. So you can kind of get this decoupling between stock and population view. Uh, and it, and it's, um, 
stock mixing is really highlighted by ICAT as a really big source of the uncertainty in our stock assessment process. So by ignoring stock mixing, we run the risk of overestimating the biomass of western origin fish. We don't really have that risk in the east because the east biomass is so high, if a few fish move over that line from west to east, it's really kind of a drop in the bucket. It doesn't really have that much impact. So when we do the stock assessment, it's pretty equal to the population because there's very little contribution here. The west is a different story. The west is very sensitive because it's so low compared to the east. If you have even a trickle coming over, it's going to really change your perception. And it's not that that's bad that we have eastern fish coming over here. We want to, um, you know, it, it's fine for us to be fishing on those fish, but we also just want to make sure, because we know this mixture is dynamic, we want to make sure we're also tracking the population. Because if this suddenly, if we set the quota, and we had a whole lot of eastern fish here, and suddenly they decided, that portion decided not to come over, we could be overfishing this smaller western origin group. And so we just want to be making sure to track both, of them, both perceptions of stock status. And that's what that otolith chemistry work allows us to do. And ICAT is really working hard to integrate that view uh, over the next few years. So um, as you, we've probably described, the bluefin tuna are really surrounded by a lot of controversy. And we've tried to hit on a lot of the controversial topics that you'll hear about um, when you hear people reporting on bluefin or talking about bluefin in conversation. And there's a lot of confusion because of the different species the different ways of viewing status. Um, but I, I think the takeaway for Wallace and I is that we do see really positive signs for Atlantic bluefin tuna recovery. Um, that's really exciting for fishery scientists and um, the managing, management community who's been trying to rebuild this uh, resource for a while. But there's still a lot of uncertainty, um, as, a, as we talked about. There's a lot of research to still be done on basic biology of bluefin tuna. And really understanding the mixing and how the mixing interacts with how we want to best manage the resource is a really important area of research as well. Um, so we hope that, um, you know, that you'll seek out reliable science-based sources of information. When you hear stuff reported, you might think twice about um, you know, whether this is a good piece of information and does it really re reflect the best available and most current science. And um, thank you guys so much for attending and for listening to us talk about our research and others' research in the field, and we'd be happy to take any questions. Yes? Um, is there any um, discussion about the eastern stock fish or the European Union and those countries um, ceasing on per se, the per se method of fishing? Because we do all our fishing by line, basically. Right, yep. I, I don't see that. <laughs> I don't see that stopping in the near no. future. So, yeah, it's so a it's it a really like they can catch so many more fish than right. they can just by method. But um, how does that speed the development? Well, the quota is much bigger, so the resource is much bigger over there. And as you look at the it, when you think about Walt's um, distribution map, um, a lot of the catch is right happening right around the med and um, right outside the med. And so there is a lot greater potential uh, for the fishery over there with much higher quotas. The interesting part of the fishery is that we are prohibited in the west from fishing on a spawning ground. Yeah. The east fishes on a, a spawning, spawning ground. ground. Yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. one of the big differences. The other problem with fisheries there, and they, they've dealt with this a little bit, but one of the other problems is uh, ranching. Yeah. So if you're given a quota of 3,000 metric tons, if I give you a quota and I say you can go out and catch 3,000 metric tons of fish, you take your purse and you go out and you catch 3,000 metric tons of fish. But then you put them in a pen and you fatten them for six months, and the 3,000 becomes 5,000. Mm -hmm. Do you take the three? Do you take the five? You only took three. You sold five, but you took three. Mm -hmm. That's another problem. Um, but yeah, I don't see the purse saners going anywhere. Nope. Yes? Is the genetic mixing? Spawning grounds are separate. You suggest at least that the east and west face, all of them stay separate for spawning. Is it genetic mixing? Um, there, yeah, our best information suggests it's very minimal. So uh, we, it, when it, based on the Olith data at least, it would say that 99% of the chance that if you were born in the Gulf of Mexico, you're going to return to that area to spawn yourself. So very little. So you only interact with western fish in the Gulf of Mexico. Right? Yes, yep, yeah. <laughs> the dealers 
and some of the fishermen say absolutely they can tell the difference. I can't, but we've never really put it to the test. A lot of the dealers we work with say that they can tell the difference, yeah. but I mean, I can't. Uh, it's a str I mean, um, visual differences are a strong um, way actually to distinguish different stocks of fish. So we use that for cod, for instance. We see strong differences in different stocks of cod. It's harder with, in, what, often what we'll do is that we'll take a picture of the fish and we'll do fine scale measurements. And actually just from pictures, you can distinguish, you know, George's Bank from Gulf of Maine cod. It's harder with a bluefin because just even getting the picture of a really big adult is uh, a challenge. And oftentimes when we interact with the um, animal, we're at the stage of just having the head and not having the full body. Um, but I have always thought it would be a cool project. It's just, it's a little more challenging with that size of fish to get uh, a full view of the, what the body looks like. And they can gain and lose 100 pounds in four months or more. Yes. Um, you're right. It seems like there have been several articles in the last couple of weeks that, on the same subject. <coughs> yeah. I was just wondering, one of the things the popular press was saying is that the, their feed is moving closer, the herring and sardines and things like that. So is the growth have anything to do with increased the, of the, of the feedlot? You want to take this one? Please? Uh, there's no question they are here to eat, right? This is like the Becky's Diner for them. They're here to, to consume food. And we often equate it with the win, stay, lose, leave theory. So if there's food here, they will most likely stay. Um, and we have found some pretty decent relationships between how the forage base is doing and how the tuna are doing. And so if, for example, the herring population is decreasing in size, decreasing in fat content, you see, this, you see the consequence of that in the tuna themselves. They will actually feel the effects of that. Because you can kind of think of each one of those pieces of food as just a packet of energy. And if your packet of energy is, has less energy in it, it still takes the same amount of energy to catch it, but you get less out of it. And so you can think of every single herring you catch. If you just got maybe 50 calories less out of every herring, every herring, and you multiply that over thousands of them over the season, that's less energy that they would have. Do we see it in the growth yet? Um, difficult to say. Probably not. We can't see at that resolution yet. And again, we can have a fish in the Gulf of Maine in one year, and in the next year it's in Tunisia, and then the next year it's in Canada, and then the next year it's in the Bahamas. And so what becomes difficult is trying to track stuff on multiple years about the fish because they may not be here multiple years. They may only have been here one year and then they're gone. So tough question, tough question. But there's no, there's, there is a connection between the forage and the condition of the fish, yes. And if the forage is in close, they will, they will come in close. They're here to eat. So, there's got to be something there for them to eat, yes. Um, so the smallest fish that you can tag with a streamer tag is like this. They'll tag little guys, you know, uh, a couple pounds, five pounds they can tag with a conventional tag. The satellite tags, which you haven't seen them, they're on the table out there. Um, you, we've done a lot of work on those. You really shouldn't go much below 32 inches, 31, 32 inches, because what happens is the antenna extends back to the caudal fin, to the tail, and so as the fish is swimming, the tag trails off the back and it starts to uh, not only irritate the tail, but it also destroys the tag. So the very small ones, we know that one-year-olds will go from the Bay of Biscay to Cape Cod, no question. One-year-old fish will make that journey all the way across the Atlantic. And so, of course, too, will the, will the larger ones. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty amazing, something that small. Last question. I just wanted to add one point to that. I always tell my students this. One of the most amazing things I find about migration is if I want to go home tonight, right, I, follow the, I know where to go. I follow the signs. I follow the landmarks. But you have an organism that's leaving, for example, the Bahamas, and it's going to travel across the open ocean with no landmarks, nothing at all. And it's going to find its way to Africa, to the British Isles, and then back to Canada. And it's going to do it like that. And on, the, that, and on, on this, sorry, I know, Lee, I'm sorry. I don't mean to take, I just have to. I'm an information guy. i got to do this, sorry. It's the professor stuff. Um, if, you, if you look at, for example, um, where'd the thing go? Uh, uh, this one right here. Okay, we tagged this fish in 2005. This is when I was working with Molly. Tagged this fish in 2005, October 2005. Made this circuitous route, came back, was caught the same week on the same anchor right there. They know where they're going. It's 
really cool. No idea, but I know I don't have any idea how they do it, but they know where they're going. It's really cool stuff. Really cool stuff. Sorry, another question up Last front. Question. Yeah. Last question. <laughs> I was just curious with the, with the fishery involved. What are the studies about herring indicating in certain locations? Because I know that the, the uh, water temperature in the Gulf of Maine is increasing. Yeah. Is that having an impact on the herring and therefore an impact potentially on the tuna fishery? I, well, Go ahead, you take it. Well, I mean, um, <laughs> this, this year's a little different. So we, we have, what we had been seeing is uh, a shift in the distribution of fish from, you know, based on the U.S. rod and reel to the Canadian rod and reel. And I think I showed that in one slide where the trends in the Canadian stock were going, indices were going up and the U.S. indices were going down. And that was attributed part, we think that's partly temperature, partly prey driven, um, but and so that had been sort of the direction things were going with things shifting northward in terms of distribution. But this year totally changed that. Um, so we're going to have to go back to the drawing board a little bit. But there's a, there's a lot more to be done there in terms of understanding uh, what's the driver. Is it the prey or the temperature driving the prey and then driving the distribution of bluefin tuna? There's some, that's sort of the connection we envision, which is the most important factor. We're still sort of trying to need some work to be done there. The interesting thing about the you know where the fish are at any given time, to my knowledge, we never went to George's Bank until this decade. Well, actually, you know, we never went out to George's. We didn't have to. Never went out to George's Bank. It was unheard of. Who would drive 160 miles each way to go catch a tuna? You could go. You could do it 10, 15, 20 miles or whatever. Um, but the Canadians always had fish on the northern edge of George's. Always had fish. They just never got them because they were very big and they were very skinny and they weren't worth a lot. Uh, but then that aggregation showed up out there, and for several years the boats went out and got those fish. So it, it's a tough thing um, to, to determine. You know, very seldom are they in the same spot year after year. After very year. dynamic. It's very dynamic. Yeah. I mean, you might catch a few, but th is that indicative of what we'd call the body of the fish? We did some work with the purse stainers years ago, and the purse stainers always, you know, if, if you were familiar with them at all. They used to set on what would, they would call the body of fish. So the pilots might see a school of 20 or 30, but that's not really what they were interested in. The last set I remember, sets I remember when we were on George's and we made, we were tagging on um, Michael's boat, the White Dove, um, eight, almost 900 fish were caught in one day because that was the body of fish. There was school upon school upon school upon school. There were also fish up and down the coast as well on all, a lot of little humps and bumps, but the, what they would call the body of fish was offshore. So just a really tough, tough thing. Yeah, that's, that's where I think the field is going though, is trying to get a mechanistic understanding of where fish are going and why, and also why, when and, when and why they move across the Atlantic Basin. I think that's sort of the ultimate goal, but it will, it will take us a while to get there. I'll answer any questions, I think, as will Lisa as we clean up, too. So if yep. you have questions you need to get to answer, Thank you. come on down. Yeah, I'll answer any questions. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, one last word uh, for Ben Bill. I know that well enough they'll stand here all night and talk about Trina. I want to thank our sponsor, which is the Morton Kelly That's you. Charitable Trust. That's um, and I want to say one other thing, which is right now we're running a match. Uh, every donation, either new donation or increase in donation, is matched by a generous sponsor. So, and uh, if you're inclined, and it is Super Thursday after all, if you're in a camp. So, if you're so inclined, uh, it would really mean a lot to us to give now because it's a, it, it is a match donation. So, thank you so much for coming tonight. Bring your friends next time. We love it when you share information about this. 